you know, the story of drama is um, is one that involved people playing, ma having masks on, to personify the sun, the moon, um, uh, a sad character, a tragic character, a, a vicious character. They were all they were all you know actors with masks, and um, and that's where drama, that's where our modern uh, acting, that's where theatre came from. You know, when Thespis was his name first stepped out of the chorus line, and. Uh, with this story, it was um, it was really was a kind of a direct throwback to those to to that type of drama, and um, I saw I really liked the challenge of being covered with certainly it was prosthetic makeup, but also with um, wrappings and bandages that that hide you know ninety five percent of my face, and being able to portray human emotions through that and use that in order to to convey various situations. I, I, that's what attracted me to it first. Secondly, it's a great story. It's a great yarn in the tradition of a uh, young hero gets, gets hard done by and, and eventually wins in the end. And uh, throughout that story, there's an, an extraordinary, um, wonderful heights and lows that, that, that occur to the character, the main character, Peyton Westlake, and the people involved with him, and and um, an extraordinary action sequences. Because it, because I am playing him, and my I've been told my certain attributes are are a certain gentleness and, and a certain softness, and that's that's what I'm investing this character with. Um, I'm uh, basically using my own my own aura to kind of. Uh, invest Peyton with what I have, you know, rather than saying, oh, I think he should have a longer nose, I think he should have a beard, let's give him a hump, let's make him very irritable, do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not about that, it's about... But yes, I think he's a gentle character who uh, has no malicious streaks in him whatsoever towards mankind or humanity, and who just wants to get on with his work. It was a transition that was it was actually quite easy to play because because Sam had written everything so clearly on the page, you know. He he had structured scenes in a certain way so that one thing followed another. And uh, it was it was easier to play than it actually seemed when I first read the script. There's a part of me and and certainly in Peyton Westlake and I think in the Dark Man too. I mean, we all have a dark side. Some of us show it more than others, others don't. But I think if we're alone in our car or in the bathroom or in the shower, you know, we, we fantasize about, you know, God, I should have told the boss that. I should have told him he's a real, you know, this, or I should have told her that, you know. And you, you do in your mind, your own persona becomes this devilish fiend, you know. Um, so yeah, I, there's a there's a part of me in that, and and there had to be, and and because there were situations in the film where this dark man goes into various rages and various uh, emotional states that you have to be able to to do, I think, and kind of do convincingly, and be able to understand why why he's in this particular state, and so. Uh, and that was a challenge too of the, of the script, that these emotions were like, they were almost operatic. They were like huge and they were big and they were full of turmoil. It wasn't about, should I have a cup of Earl Grey or coffee? The little things that we're bombarded with every day in our daily lives. But these were, you know, big, big issues, you know, dealing with mankind and the cosmos and hell and heaven and purgatory and revenge and justice and love and hate. And, you know, the, the big ones, you know. So, uh, and, th and that's always great to play because you can go kind of full throttle at it, you know. Being able to project through the mask, uh, the prosthetic makeup first and then the mask over it, was uh, a huge consideration, obviously. And it was a, a large, a big consideration with Sam Raimi, the director. Sam was worried that the actor playing Peyton Stroke, the dark man, wouldn't be able to convey or would, would find it hard to convey emotions through this, having like one slit there to be able to see the eyes. And um, 
I, I, I actually, I, I could see the challenge of it and could see how difficult it would be, but I, it actually didn't worry me because the thing that I had to do as the actor was, once I have this five hours of prosthetic makeup on, not to think of it as five hours of prosthetic makeup, that this is now my skin, that it's not a barrier, that it's, that I have to kind of absorb it through some weird osmosis process, you know? And to not try and overcompensate for things, like not to try and get, get out through that mask, that was to accept it, you know, rather than push against it, just bring it into my own thing, you know? It's, uh, I, I can only think of the, the um, Cyril Cusick, who's a, who's a very famous Irish, old Irish actor, great actor. And Cyril has a very, very, very light sounding voice. But once he goes on stage in front of like 12, 1,300 people, especially in the Abbey Theatre, which seats about 1,000 people, and it's a huge barn of a building. You really have to project so that people in the back row can hear you. And Cyril being this very, very light speaker, once he's on stage, you can hear him so clearly. And he's never actually, you know, really vocally trying to, to push it out. But he does a mental thing. He he kind of tells the audience to come into him, you know. He invites them into his world rather than him trying to push his story out to them. So I, 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 I know Cyril, and I and I remember him talking about this, and I, I, I sort of used that, and I, I hope I think it's worked. I'm not sure in in getting this, uh, in not allowing these bandages to become a mask in the sense that it's going to block something or change something, you know. Um, certainly certain um, physical things I had to change uh, just to make it a little bit more broader, a little bit bigger. Um, but having the costume, having these wonderful clothes on, that, that you have to perform in a certain way. It's not like having a t-shirt and jeans where you can, you know, scratch your face and do that. You can't do that in this costume. It commands you to, to stand in a certain way, to gesture in a certain way, to turn in a certain way, because it's it's got these incredible lines to it, you know? The sort of things I've endured for the role have been um, makeup first thing in the morning. Calls have been, I've been getting up as early as 1.30, 2.30 in the mornings. Now, I, Make up. It's usually start about three thirty, four o'clock, sometimes five o'clock, and that's with a lion. Uh, there are various stages of it, depending on how much of my face is being revealed, uh, and that makeup can take from two hours to three hours to the full, the full works, which is like five hours, five and a half hours, depending on how fast or slow we are. Um, so that is an ordeal, but it's. When I'm in the chair, it's not an ordeal. I, I knew this was going to happen, and I uh, I prepared for it very physically, like an athlete, and I, I still do. I've been getting up two hours before my call, usually, to, to do a workout and stuff, because that's what you have to do. It's like it's training for a fight, you know? It's like a 15-round fight. It's an 18, 19-week shoot, uh, and that's... That's what's required in order to go in front of the cameras to portray this. But what I don't want to do is, is you know, when the cameras start turning, is to, I hope I haven't done this, is to appear in front of the camera knowing I've done six hours of work beforehand, you know what I mean? That you're carrying that work with you. That when you arrive on camera, you're absolutely fresh and that this stuff in your face is your face. So I've... Uh, so that's been a kind of an ordeal, but we have the most wonderful, I mean, really wonderful special effects makeup guys, and Tony Gardner uh, and Larry Hamlin, and they're a team of workers. And, you know, we've become really close and really good friends. And, and if, it, if those guys were any less, uh, less than the artists they are, it, would, it really would have been an ordeal with a capital O, you know? But they've been great. and. Uh, you know, the crew uh, all from Sam down have been really wonderful. And, and I'm not just saying that. They have been, like, special, all the ADs and stuff. And everyone has been aware of, you know, 
how long the makeup takes and people are being considerate and nice and, and just really want to look after you, you know, so that so that when you do go in front of the cameras you're you're not carrying any chips in your shoulders or any gripes and stuff. And um, but you know, but within that I I've found I've had to maintain a certain uh, discipline as regards cutting people out of my life, you know, that I I don't want to sit around and chit chat to the grips and the sparks and I've just got to keep to myself, you know, and uh, because it's it's such a, a waste of energy to have to talk to somebody. And once I've got all this stuff on, they're inevitably going, "What did you say?" I said, you know, and you have to vocalise everything two, three times, and it's 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 just a waste of energy. So I've just kept myself to myself, which is what I've had to do, and, and that's proved to be the best thing. And if if it has upset any people or people think I'm being rude, then it's it's tough. I, I I just really have to keep myself focused on it, you know. Um, there have been there's been a lot of physical activity in the film, uh, in the uh, uh, physical torture scene. There's four or five guys beat me up and put me in acid and blow me up and kick me and throw me into plate glass windows and stuff. So there's been all that kind of stuff, but all very well choreographed, um, um, very well planned and thought out. And there has rarely been one element of danger, one I can think of. It was a helicopter sequence uh, where the dark man is, this helicopter's on the roof of a building, my building. Um, in this helicopter is Larry Drake, um, is one of his little henchmen and the and the pilot, and um, I'm required to go up to Larry and try and pull him out. And as I'm pulling him out, Larry says to his pilot, "Take the chopper up, take it up." So the chopper rises into the air. I'm hanging on to Larry, or my character's hanging on to Larry, and I'm trailing out of the side of this helicopter. Well, when we did that particular piece of the shot, Sam insisted to me that I'd be taken up only 15 feet. So I was uh, duly harnessed in and strapped in and stuff. And the sequence began and Larry and I are acting our hard side, you know, doing all these kicks and pulls and grabs and shouting and fists going. And as I swing back to, to punch Larry, my peripheral vision catches the, all the trucks and all the people like that size, way down on the ground, you know. I'm thinking, 15 feet, you know. I, Suddenly, I just clung onto the side of that helicopter. I must have been, I was like 150 feet off the ground, you know. I mean, I was harnessed in and stuff. But that was uh, terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. I get dizzy on a thick carpet anyway, so it was. But we got the shots, so that was good, you know. I, I enjoy the physicality of the film and the action very, very much. I mean, I think in every actor and every actress, there's a little boy, little girl who wants to climb up in their treehouse and play cowboys and Indians and stuff, you know? And this, you know, it gives you a chance as an adult to kind of indulge in these childhood fantasies. It's great to do that stuff. It's very arduous work, it's very long work because it's, it obviously has to be broken up into tiny, tiny sequences because there's obviously a certain amount of danger involved so everything has to be choreographed to the nth degree. But that being said, once the cameras roll and you have to charge on top of the building and a, you know, a flame bursts 20 feet from your head and something else happens, it really is exciting. Yeah, it is. When this rage montage, he has all the, well, maybe you'll see it when we, but he has the, the, the scene, scenario behind my head, like dissolving, like just melting, all the facade melting. And then there's a cut to these pink elephants all kind of, turning to look at look at Peyton, you know, which adds to this rage, you know? It's like everything's turning against them. It's like the whole world's looking at me, you know? So I must get the elephant for my girlfriend, you know? And that's what happens in those things, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? I don't mean yeah. that, but but if you if you allow it to, to seep into your mind, it's like, well, it's your whole, your whole maleness is at stake, you know? And those, Fucking carnivals. <laughs> Sam Raimi reminds me of a Catholic schoolboy who 
um, is playing hooky from school. And he's, he, he always wears a shirt and tie, and he always has this little look in his face as if, whoops, I'm going to be found out any minute, and I'm going to be taken straight back to the chemistry lab, which is where I should be, you know, studying for my exams, you know. He's, um, he's a remarkable guy. He's, uh, he's quite a remarkable director. Um, he's inventive. He's phrased this, this, the story of Darkman as his creation. It's his conception. Uh, various other writers had a hand in it, but it's, it's Sam's baby. Um, the, the, thing I, uh, the thing I like about him most is, is his invention as a director. He's, um, he is so inventive with the camera. He makes the camera do extraordinary things that I've, I've done 16 features and I've never worked with a director who, who makes the camera work for you. And indeed, he makes the camera work for you as the actor too, you know? In fact, in early, um, very early days of the shoot, when I saw him doing incredible like, close-ups, zooming into an eyeball, I'd say, Sam, what are you showing in this? And well, you've just seen something and I want the audience to see that you're going to, this is going to affect you in some way. So perhaps a reaction that I would have been working on, I think, well, I have to cut that by 90% because Sam's camera is doing, doing it all for me. So we kind of ironed that out and we had managed to talk about it. And uh, because you do have to marry, I was aware of, you know, Tom's, or Tom, uh, Sam's incredible expertise with the camera and that he wants to show all this technical ability, but he still has to marry it with my, my process or with the other actor's process. And, uh, and you know, leaving myself aside, but he's certainly working with a very, very wonderful group of established actors, you know and very, very good actors. Um, so that, um, I think Sam is still learning what an actor can actually do for him in front of a camera. Um, but that being said, this is, a, this is a big sweep of a film. There's lots of action. There's lots of uh, wonderful uh, uh, aerobics of character interaction and situations and stuff. And, he, he is remarkable, and he's 29 years of age too, which, uh, he's, and he's a joy to work with. He's, I have never seen the guy lose his temper. Um, he always keeps an element of lightness to it. I don't mean he, he treats it superficially, but his, his essence is always sort of light. What I'm thankful to him for, actually, as an actor, and, uh, and I guess I'm an established actor. I don't mean in the sense that people recognize me, but I've been doing this for 20 years, and I, I guess I'm established in certain ways, you know, of how I would approach a part, and, and yet Sam was able to, I, I, my research and all was, was still as I wanted it to be, but he strips you away of all, of all my 16 films experience. He kind of has stripped me away and said, okay, this is what I'm going to do with the actor and the camera. This is the relationship I'm going to work on. And you've got to trust that, you know, and not, but yeah, but that's silly. You can't do that with the camera. Do you know what I mean? Because then you're, it's, you've, you've just got to trust them and go with them, you know, and rely on them and, and to really enjoy it. And I've, that, is, that has fed me and it's actually fed the dark man, you know. Once I see what he's doing with the camera, then I try and imagine what, yeah, the camera's going to do that, it's going to do that, which means this, this movement should be much bigger, it should be more forceful, or it should be more timid, or, you know, and it's, it's uh, technically what he's doing has is, is, is fueled my uh, idea of what this dark man is and could get up to and what his potential is, uh, which wouldn't have happened if I'd have put barriers up and thought, He's, he's interrupting in the actor's process. He's, this, this is my world, you know? So he is, uh, he, you know, he is, I, I've learned a great lesson from him. I've worked with maybe three actresses that I think are, are great, in the true sense of the word great, and, and Fran McDermott certainly is one of them. Her input into uh, not just the character she was playing, but into uh, her interaction with my character, and. And some of these scenes that seemed quite 
superficial to a certain extent as regards what's happening between Peyton Westlake and his girlfriend Julie Hastings. She, um, Fran was able to invest it with just much more richness, you know, uh, which, which I think is a sign of a great actress, that she just doesn't play the lines. She plays the lines, but she also gives you a past history of this person, you know, and makes it all three-dimensional so that you as the audience will look and say, yeah, I really believe in that relationship. And I think Sam and Rob Tabard and Universal are just really lucky to, to have I'm, I'm really glad they, they, they got her to play this part. We, we both agreed that, uh, that that is the groundwork for this story. That is the, that's the platform that the story has to spring from. It has to spring from not just Peyton Westlake, the scientist, but it has to spring from this relationship. That you see that at the beginning and an audience feels very, very comfortable with these two people. That you know they go back a long way, they're linked inextricably linked um, from the age of 12, 13, you know? And you've got to give that to an audience and they've got to believe it so that everything else that happens after that uh, is, uh, comes from that solid platform, you know, of this relationship. So we, and we have very few scenes to do it and there's probably three, four within the course of the whole film. So we were really meticulous and working out a history for these two people and and I I hope we I hope we've succeeded, you know? I certainly think Fran has. I I have seen maybe three LA laws. Um and, and I've seen Larry once and that I'm I'm sort of ashamed to say. But uh so I, I, I knew that the character he was playing in LA Law was a was mentally retarded gentleman. Uh, the Larry I met was this incredibly uh, like theater trained, very proper spoken, very, very uh, bright intellectual actor. And, uh, and he, 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 he plays Durant, this unbelievably evil guy with that same incredible intelligence and brightness and alertness, which you know compounds to the evil, you know. Uh, and it's kind of like the opposite of what the dark man gets up to, you know? He's, uh, Larry, Larry's very remarkable too. He, he, he's, there's a, there are a few scenes in the film whereby I, as the dark man, portray him in order to infiltrate the gang. But, uh, but in order to achieve that, Larry has to play me playing himself uh, and, and that was quite remarkable to watch another actor being you being them if you can follow that well for a start I wanted to be on set the first couple of times that Larry was was doing this uh, because it was because as I say it's me is doing it um, and I felt well if if I had got together a few times with Larry and we'd talked about, well, I, I think the dark man, as regards a, a physical thing, he's got a slight thing on his right side that's from the from the tortures. Um, maybe he does something with his neck every now and again. And I think if he's, if he's uh, portraying somebody else with this mask on, I think he would keep all his movements to an absolute minimum so as he wouldn't give the game away, so that the other gang members wouldn't notice too much. And, you know, that, that was my little input. That's all I could say, you know, without saying, no, 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 Larry, please don't do it that way. This is how I would do it, you know. You can't do that, you know. Uh, but Larry just, you know, he, he knew exactly what had to be done. And, and he was remarkable, you know, because he, I kind of felt proud afterwards because I sort of thought, well, that's me doing that. And that's really good, you know. Colin, uh, the only, time we've worked in the film was was on the, the scaffolding you know uh, but we actually have very very similar backgrounds Colin's originally from Scotland from Glasgow um, we're we've both done a lot of theater and stuff and we've actually played parts that we, that we both played you know different stages throughout the world he's um, and we have mutual friends so uh, we're kind of similar in a way I think we're we're sort of down-to-earth sort of guys you know 
Um, but, you know, there it comes to a close because when Colin puts the suit on, he's this, like, you know, head of this corporation. And again, a very wicked gentleman, a very, very bright, intelligent guy. And, uh, uh, and, uh, but he's 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 more dapper than the dark man. He's cool. He's very sophisticated. He's light on his feet. He's shifty, whereas I'm a bit more cumbersome and sort of. So the only time we really work is on this this uh, the top of this size skyscraper, uh, which should I say? No, we're working on that at the moment. I can't really kind of. Cause... But it was um, again. It was a delight. He's very very easy to work with, and I think. Uh, when you work with, uh, this might be a wee bit presumptuous, but when you're working with theater trained actors like Fran McDermott, like Larry, and like Colin, you, you have a, a shorthand language between you that you can, that you can uh, get into very easily and solve a lot of problems without going through endless discussions and going through various directors and assistant directors. And it can just be, you know, he might say to me, Liam, could you just, when you say this line, could you just, you know, give me a beat there before you come in so that I can do this, you know? So we we have this short, shorthand thing going on all the time that I, I think theatre actors would understand perhaps more easily than than screen actors would, you know? Uh, so we put that to full effect on this girder sequence, which was very, very physical and which had to be choreographed very meticulously because we're thousands of feet above the ground, of course. <laughs> and uh, so he, he's very, very easy to work with. Great guy. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's very different to what I've done before, uh, which was another reason why I wanted to do it. Uh, it was also the chance to play like six characters in one, <laughs> namely <laughs> Hunchback of Notre Dame, Jekyll and Hyde, and Phantom of the Opera, and Boris Karloff, you know? They were all, it's those encapsulated in one, plus a lot more. Uh, um, so that's where it fits in. It was, uh, and it was also a chance to play a huge, big, fat lead in a huge, big, fat film. And I wanted the responsibility of that and felt felt I wanted that for, like, for the past three years. I played Leeds before in, in England and Ireland and stuff, but this was like a huge big kind of, um, it was a real, I mean, it's a big, it's a big part. And I, f I felt eager and ready for that, and it came my way, so I, and it was, uh, as I say, I was ready for it. I wanted to do it. 